Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Tyler, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the practice of adaptive leadership, tools and tactics for changing your organization and the world. Uh, the book is by Ronald Heifetz, Alexander Grashow, and Marty Linsky. It was originally published in 2009. Uh, so to get started, let's talk a little bit about the author's views on leadership. Um, they think it's an organic process. Uh, it, that means that there's an improvisational quality to it. Um, it doesn't mean that you go in without a plan, but it does mean that the plan should be organic and should grow and change um, as you execute it. Uh, it's accessible and should be diversified. Uh, that's to say that it should be uh, enacted at all levels of an organization and is valuable from different perspectives. Um, it's possible to leverage leadership from any position within the organization. Um, you don't have to be a manager or a CEO uh, in order to enact this type of leadership and uh, you know to participate in this philosophy. Um, and it's a practice that is equal parts analysis and action. Um, that is to say that it, it requires formulation and execution. And um, we'll, we'll see that a little bit here in a minute. Uh, so the big picture um, for, for this book is it's a reference and a guide. Um, you know, I've got this uh, quote here. You can read this book from start to finish or browse to find the concepts and tools most useful for your understanding and dealing with a particular adaptive challenge you are facing. Uh, and I've definitely found that to be very true. It was kind of like reading a textbook, uh, not in a bad way, but the concepts were laid out um, very formulaically. Uh, and the authors identify the two major steps to adaptive leadership as diagnosis and action. Um, they call this on the balcony and on the practice field. That's kind of like, um, they say that if you're up on the balcony, you can see the movements that all of the, the players are making on the field. And then, you know, being on the field is, is it, the execution of, you know, like what, what you're taking in from the balcony. So uh, this, this has gotten thrown around a lot already. Um, so I figure it's best to define this in the author's terms. So what is adaptive? Um, for starters, adaptive is an adjective. Uh, which is a bad joke, but it does take us into the details of adaptive versus technical challenges, um, but there's a little bit more on that later. So the authors define adaptive leadership as an approach to making progress on important challenges. Um, and adaptive challenges are those that don't necessarily have a clear path. Um, they require a deep level of consideration and, and, and interests of uh, various different parties and asking those parties to make sacrifices in order to enact change that has a net positive effect. Uh, so adaptive change is the improvised use of adaptive leadership techniques to address adaptive challenges. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, but, but hopefully as we, as we go through this further, you'll be able to see um, you know, you know, more on that. So, uh, this is the table of contents uh, as it's roughly laid out in the book. Um, part one is purpose and possibility. Uh, it's about defining challenges and where you are relative to those challenges. Um, diagnosing the system. This is kind of that on the balcony. Um, what is happening in the environment type of mentality. Um, mobilizing the system is figuring out what levers to pull to get people to act on the changes that you are proposing. Um, part four is see yourself as a system. Um, this is about recognizing that you have an inherent um, effect on the system in which you are participating and that that system has an effect on you as well. And then part five is deploying yourself, which is kind of a little, um, so it's, it's strategies for, um, you know, uh, I guess encouraging your participation and looking at the net positive effects and how to deal with failure, that sort of thing. Um, so part one is purpose and possibility. 
Uh, and so our purpose in the organization is to, and, and, and in terms of making change, is to observe the environment, make critically sound interpretations, and Bill's ways to challenge the parts of that environment that are holding the organization back. And we do that by looking at this figure one above. Um, we observe what is happening in the system. We make interpretations about what is actually going on. And then we design interventions to um, you know, uh, enact our change. And then from there, we again, observe what is happening and it creates a kind of cyclical effect. Um, this is a this is a great quote that I that I really enjoyed from the text here is uh, there's no such thing as a dysfunctional organization because every organization is perfectly aligned to achieve the results that it currently gets, um, and so you know that it it kind of makes sense. It's like yeah, of course, well one equals one, um, but you know when when you think about it, that is where organizations run into problems is that. Um, certain lines of play become ingrained and standardized and, uh, you know, people naturally are aversive to change. And so, you know, when, when these lines of play that are actually harmful or were good for a particular situation um, sort of outlive their usefulness, well, then that's where you run into this, you know, how do we get people to change their way of thinking about what's actually going on. Um, and, and then I mentioned this a bit earlier, but we're talking about uh, a, a technical versus an, an adaptive change here. And in figure two on the right-hand side, you can see um, you know, a, a technical problems have clear definition and clear solution. And uh, adaptive problems have it, it requires learning in order to, um, you know, come up with a solution that is actually going to move your organization forward. Um, and so, you know, a, a, another thing about adaptive change is that it's, uh, and, and this is my second highlighted quote here is, um, you know, that says, give yourself license to assess your own skills and to determine whether you are the right person to intervene or someone else would have a better chance of success. Um, I think that is kind of the author's way of saying, pick your battles. Um, you don't want to apply this too liberally. And, and the reason for that is, is right above this, we talk about the productive zone of disequilibrium. Um, and that is, you know, you're, you're generating enough buzz around the change that you're proposing that it puts it into direct conflict within the system. And there's tension. This tension is how you're going to actually generate the forward change. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit more about the, the heat concept um, a little bit later. Um, but just an idea to keep in mind is that, you know, you when you're when you're enacting these changes there is some inherent degree of risk and so you want you want to make sure that you're really committed to the changes that you are uh proposing in order you know so so that you know you, you really think you're enacting the most possible good so part two is diagnose the system and 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 this and uh and the next section are actually my favorite parts of the book um and so Diagnosing the system, you know, from a from a thirty thousand foot view, is and that's exactly what it is. Actually, is you have to know what to look for in the organization in order to propose changes in an effective way, in a way in which they'll be well received in your organization. And this section is entirely about that. And if you look at Figure Three on the right here, um, you can see. Uh, it's it's got all of these um, you know various aspects that this, this is a concept that comes up a lot in this book is that there are a lot of different factors at play that are pulling on the organization and the system and even your own changes and so identifying and naming these factors so that you understand how they're working is critical to your success. And that's, that's really what this chapter is all about, or uh, I guess this part of the book. Um, so, you know, 
the authors say, adaptive leadership requires understanding the group's culture and assessing which aspects of it facilitate change and which stand in the way. Um, so this is talking specifically about the change, but then the authors go into diagnose the political landscape. Um, assessing the political landscape as a system is critical to enacting adaptive change. Uh, so it follows that one element of thinking politically involves ferreting out the losses you're asking people to take. You need to identify these potential losses and help people survive them. Um, so again, this is, this is all about uh, understanding people's stake in the changes that you are proposing. Um, because if you don't understand where people are coming from, uh, in their opposition to your change, then you really stand no chance of actually changing anything um, because they'll be so staunchly opposed. Um, and so uh, another another part of this is diagnosing that you know you're diagnosing the political landscape, but you also need to diagnose the adaptive challenges. Um, and and so it's they say uh, look for two major characteristics. Um, a cycle of failure and a persistent dependence on authority. Uh, and, and that is a really interesting concept if you're going to identify um, where the change needs to be implemented. Um, a cycle of failure and a persistent dependence on authority. Um, it's, it's kind of suggesting that you know, it's um, it's it's like the old uh, adage, um, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the, uh, a different result. Um, and so, when when you see this cycle of failure and persistent dependence on authority, um, you know, you, you know that there is this decision that people are incapable of making on their own, and so it's always being kicked back to their manager or boss. And that's how you know where you have a real problem uh, in your organization. Um, so, so part two, diagnose the system. You need to diagnose the challenge that you are actually trying to attack, and you need to diagnose the landscape of, you know, the 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 potential stakeholders in this challenge's change. Uh, so part three is mobilize the system. Um, this is my other favorite section in this book, I think. Um, and so this is all about making interpretations. Um, if people associate the issue with their system of operation rather than themselves personally, they will focus their attention on the means to enact change within it. And this actually comes up a bunch in the book. Like if you can shift people's focus from, oh, you're saying there's a problem with me to you're saying that this is a problem in the system, then they'll actually be so much more receptive to that. And, and so this, this figure four on the, on the right hand side here, um, this is sort of talking about where you want to frame your arguments. You want to shift people's interpretations from the technical, the benign, the individual to the adaptive, the conflictual, the systemic. You want to, you, in other words, you want people to focus on what is wrong with the way things work in the system, not necessarily what's wrong with the way they are doing things. Um, and, and, and so this section is, is all about how do you motivate people to act in a particular way? And also how do you set yourself up for success in the inaction? And, and so that's where this next, next point here comes is act politically. When you see a difficult adaptive challenge on the horizon, develop a plan for building up your informal authority regarding that challenge. And informal authority, uh, the way that they've defined it is, it is uh, authority that is outside or above what is actually in your job description. Um, and, and so informal authority is if you have uh, you know, another party that agrees with you about a particular thing and they bring expertise that you do not yourself possess to the table, then they, you know, by working together, you increase your formal or informal, excuse me, authority within the system. Uh, and so they identify a few ways to expand your informal authority. 
That's by identifying supportive stakeholders. We kind of covered that one. Um, I, this is a really interesting one. Past opponents make compelling allies. Uh, it's kind of an idea that they cover on page 159. And, and that is if you can convince someone in your organization who has previously opposed initiatives that you have attempted to enact that your new initiative is going to benefit them and and you know it, it very well should if you're going to try to do that but it, if you can convince them that they should support your cause that is visible the the removal of the blocker between you is visible to the rest of the organization and it really makes people think oh yeah like these guys are working together on this. That is not something that I would have expected. This must be a big deal. Um, and so uh, identifying new opponents by determining who stands to lose the most if your intervention goes forward. Um, this, this kind of goes back to uh, diagnosing the system. And so you can find uh, you know, who, who is going to lose if your intervention goes forward and how can you mitigate the loss for those people and I, I said that we'd come back to the idea of, uh, you know, the temperature and turning up the heat. And um, so this is the, the productive disequilibrium zone. Um, your goal is to keep the temperature, that is the intensity of the disequilibrium created by discussion of the conflict, high enough to motivate people to arrive at creative next steps and potentially useful solutions but not so high that it drives them away or makes it impossible for them to function. Um, that is like a really interesting concept. It, it, it means that you wanna make sure that you are keeping your change in a position that is top of mind and productive. Um, you, you don't want your, your initiative to be shelved, um, but you, but you do want to make sure that, that there is, and I said this earlier, um, and it's also said in the book a few times, you, you do want to make sure that there is some tension in the organization because that's how things actually move forward. Uh, and so here we come to part four and I'm sorry that the, the text keeps getting smaller on these slides. Uh, it was a lot to pack in. Um, but, uh, so, you know, I said, um, this is sort of a full circle. This is a part four, see yourself as a system. Uh, and, and this is kind of a full circle idea, mentioned it again at the beginning, but here we are. Um, and this is that you are a system that has um, levers that are being operated by the system that you are inside of. Um, and so, uh, you know, you are being pulled on by your colleagues, your community, uh, different factions in the organization, um, your ancestors, which is sort of, it's not like, you know, um, your great grandma or something like that. It's the idea is uh, people that have been really influential on you and not wanting to disappoint them um, or do something that's outside of, you know, like what they would expect you to do. Um, and, uh, you know, it's make sure that you identify your loyalties to colleagues, community, and ancestors, that you can acknowledge your part, and also that you can acknowledge your part of the problem in the organization because you exist within it. Um, that is to say that uh, there is probably some um, element that you are you know, uh, contributing to the adaptive change. And so knowing what that is uh, makes you uh, a, a bit stronger and more competent to, uh, you know, pull it forward um, so that, you know, um, it, it makes it easier for you to uh, have discourse with different parties about you know, what sacrifices they are going to be asked to make and what you are going to be sacrificing as well by allowing this change to, you know, come to fruition. Um, and so when you, when you start to take this diagnostic approach to yourself, um, it's also a good idea to know what your roles are within the organization. Um, and, and, and a role here is kind of like a, um, 
you know, uh, like there is your job description, that is a role, but frequently, um, you know, if you go above and beyond to, you know, do certain things that can be sort of considered a role, um, past people that you've worked with are a role. And, and, and actually that's, that, that brings me to this first bullet point here, which is, um, with no history, there is no reason for mistrust between two parties. And, this is interesting. It's it's both a, a strength and a weakness, right? Um, because if you haven't worked with somebody before, it may be more difficult to find out what motivates them. But if you have worked with them before, and you know maybe things haven't gone uh, your particular way, um, then you know, or or in a way that benefits you both mutually, then you know they they may have a reason for mistrust. So it's it's important to, you know, before taking on new roles to look at the differences between, um, you know, you know, those two extremes of having a role and having participated with another part of the system before. Um, and, and, you know, the authors seem to have an idea about this. They say, the more roles you play, the more factions you will be a part of, and the more people with whom you will have connections as you try to make progress on tough issues. Um, and so that, that kind of goes back to acting politically and expanding your informal authority. Um, but, uh, and then, and then this, is, uh, this is great. Um, you know, see yourself as a system. And this is know your tuning. This is a, a full section in the book and another one that really resonated with me. Um, for many people, the idea that you are always influenced by your surroundings and history challenges dearly held notions of free will. Yet if you can get on the balcony and observe the forces acting on you, you actually are exercising free will by, by just, you know, by, by observing yourself. You, you have acknowledged the reality that you are embedded in a web of relationships and are influenced by those relationships. So you create more freedom for yourself to act with the understanding of those influences rather than merely to react unthinkingly to them. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, an idea that, you know, um, I think is coming up a lot is uh, knowing your triggers. Um, you know, if somebody says something that triggers you, it sort of makes you like irrational. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it kind of clouds your vision of what's actually going on. Um, and, and I think they put it really well when they said a narrow and unambiguous view of yourself can give other people in your organization clues to managing you in ways that keep you where they want you to be. And so not actually observing yourself and, and eschewing that idea of, you know, looking at yourself as a system actually limits your capacity to uh, avoid this type of manipulation. Um, and then one last idea that they, that they come into is that uh, you have to make choices um, and stand by them when you are acting as a leader and when you are proposing changes. Um, because, because failure to do so may cost you, uh, you know, both options with regard to your choice. And so part five is deploy yourself. Um, it, you know, they, they say you need to stay connected to your purpose. Um, they say when you're taking on new roles, you need to be courageous, but find low risk contexts uh, in which to, you know, experience being incompetent. Um, and also give yourself permission to fail. Um, if you broaden your definition of success, then, you know, maybe, you know, something that would have been a failure actually has some kind of lesson learned tied to it. Um, and then uh, another important idea here is that uh, listening to what other people have to say is so important because you can pinpoint the cause of their resistance to your changes. And, and that can be just as impactful as, you know, steamrolling them. Um, they may open up another perspective that you had not considered um, and, and strengthen the uh, actual material of your change. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they talk a lot about um, doing these things within the context of running an experiment. Um, you know, it, it's a good idea to frame these things as experiments. Um, you must push the limits of what others think you ought to be doing, um, but you don't want to do this in a flagrant way. Um, you, you know, you're just kind of checking to see if it will work. 
Um, and, and, you know, as always, I'm a big, big proponent of this one. Acknowledge what you do not know or explicitly try on a new role where everyone knows you are new to that effort. Um, I think that's, uh, that's solid advice. It, it shows that you're going above your station and it prepares people, um, you know, for the inevitability that you're going to try something new and, and really push past um, what they think your boundaries are. Um, and then practice both optimism and realism. I think uh, it's a simple quote, but I think it's a, a good one. Um, you know, you need to be aware of the fact that, that you should have the best hope for your changes, but that they also may not work out in your favor every time. Uh, so here's Andy's subjectivity corner. Uh, how did I like this book? Well, I, I gave it a nine out of 10. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm an engineer. I mentioned that in my introduction. Um, and this book is like a social engineering textbook. It gives you, um, it gives you, it, it almost gives you tangible things that you can look at and, and, and put them back together, um, you know, to, 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 to run these types of experiments that we're talking about. Um, it's great to read through it once so that you know where everything is. Um, and it's, probably stronger if you've read through it front to back, cover to cover one time, um, because then you can start to use it as a reference, like a textbook, um, you know, to say, oh, I, I need an idea about how to deal with this one particular situation. And you know exactly where to look for it. Um, and it offers a lot of strategies and good advice. Um, you know, it, it does come with inherent risk, but they offer a lot of good ways to mitigate those risks. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I liked it because these, these exercises can be undertaken regardless of the source of the initiative. You can actually apply everything that they're saying to other people's initiatives too. Um, and that, that kind of goes along with running experiments and taking risks and forming roles. You know, a lot of the things, a lot of the concepts in this book are quite circular. Um, my one gripe with the book is that every section is packed with stories and questions that can sort of like help you brainstorm. I think that's probably more useful when you're using this book as a reference, um, but really it just sort of adds to every page and it can, it can be a little tiresome to get through uh, each and every one of those things, um, especially when you're not looking to apply it in the, in the short term. Um, so, you know, tying this back to what we'll be looking at this week, uh, it's week five, challenge the process. Um, and so some, some key points of, you know, contingency here that I saw was this book is firmly grounded in how to identify and effectively challenge detrimental organizational processes and, or I said practices, but it's the same thing. Um, it, it teaches you how to look at these things and good strategies for, for, you know, uh, assessing and attacking them. Um, this, this book discusses how to successfully leverage and utilize your vulnerabilities within an organization. It teaches you in a lot of ways that you have vulnerabilities, but it also teaches you how to identify them, which is a, a immensely important part. Um, and the authors believe that adaptive change cannot be successfully undertaken alone, and that improving organizations and communities is a group effort, um, really tying back into that idea of um, you know, building uh, communities and, and um, you know, expanding your informal authority um, is a really effective way to, to do that. Uh, okay, well, that's everything that I have. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope that this has been informative and that you have enjoyed this. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys in the comments. Take care.